Hey everyone, I'm back to talk about the European realm. Um, I always tell you this, that I'm going to try to make this shorter, um, and I always fail to do so, so I'm going to keep my promise on this lecture video. Um, I looked over this slideshow, and it's like 90 slides, so I'm definitely going to cut through this a little bit more quickly than normal. So, everything that you see on these slides is in your textbook. So, I'm just going to go through this, and I'm really going to just skip over some parts of this just because you are reading this in your textbook. What I'm going to try to do is just highlight some things <clears throat> that I think are important for you to pay particular attention to. Um, or maybe expand on some things that it really doesn't say in the textbook, but some background information will help you. Um, when you do read this stuff. Uh, one thing that I do want to emphasize right now before we get started in this is the videos that I share as assignments, I do want y'all to read those. Typically they're YouTube videos and they're very educational and they're a little bit more entertaining than just reading your textbook and the information in those are more like to the point, real world and sometimes current events that you don't get out of your textbook. Particularly right now, because one of the main stories that we have going on in the world is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I'm going to start talking about that in this homework assignment, in this chapter. We'll continue to talk about that in the next chapter, because the following chapter is going to be on Russia. Ukraine is actually in Eastern Europe, so it kind of overlaps the two realms. So we're kind of talking about it in each of the two realms. So... I just wanted to point that out. So talking about Ukraine, talking about NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that group, um, those are going to be important topics that you need to pay attention to because you're going to see those again. Let me get my presentation. There we go. So um, again, here are some catchphrases. And as we go through this, this is a map of Europe, obviously. And I'm going to give you some scale on this in just a second. But you can see there's a whole lot of countries in a pretty small area. It's one of the smaller realms that we're going to going to go over. But it probably packs the biggest punch of most of the realms that we're going to cover. Because Europe has had such an influence on the rest of the world. Um, Europe has influenced the world greatly as we know it today. Um, both from where it is located and what they do there now, all the way back in history to colonization and, you know, bringing culture to the rest of the world. Now, I'll tell you right now, some of that is positive and very good. Some of it is not so good. Um, we've already talked about the Americas, North, Middle, and South American realms and the influence that European culture has had on those realms through colonization, whether it be voluntary or forced upon the local indigenous populations, um, they have great influence. So here's the list of some of the more pertinent ideas or catch words or whatever. You're going to read about all these in your textbook. I'm not going to go over each of these. But here's a world map. And I, I wanted to show this world map just to give you a little bit of a scale. So, this, of course, is the entire world with all the continents. And this little area right here is Europe. Now, we define, we're going over geography in the term of realms this semester. And this is typically how modern geography is taught, world geography. When I studied back a long time ago when I was in college, we used to study the continents, which you have North America, you have South America, Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, Antarctica, which there's not much to study because there's only scientists there, no real population. So that's how we used to study it. But now we study realms. If you look at the continent, Europe has always been called a continent. Humans have this need or desire to categorize things. And because Europe was so culturally significant throughout history, it was called a continent. Although, as you can see here physically, this is all one big landmass. 
this Europe is part of Asia and actually you could walk from Asia to Africa. They're connected here at the Sinai Peninsula. So really, Africa, Asia, and Europe are all one big continuous landmass, even though they're called different continents. So we're going to focus on Europe, which is basically what I'm circling right here with my pointer. Very small area. It's the very westernmost end of this landmass that they sometimes is called Eurasia. You can see that right here. It's called Eurasia. But this part's called Europe. Where that boundary is, is debatable. It depends on who's teaching the course or who you're talking to. When I studied, there's a chain of mountains right here called the Ural Mountains. We'll talk about those when we go over Russia in our next chapter. But the Ural Mountains, when I was young, in all of the geography classes then, kind of delineated that as the, the eastern border of Europe, the western border of Asia. And all of Russia to the west of the Ural Mountains was kind of thought of as the European part of Russia. That's where Moscow is. That's where most of the population of Russia is, is in this area right here, east of the Ural Mountains. Now, since I was young, and some of your all's age, when I was in college, a lot have, has changed. Now, obviously, the Ural Mountains have not moved. That's all still there. The physical environment is still there. However, the political landscape and the way we define countries and the cultures there have changed significantly. So now, most people would probably say that the boundary of Europe is more on the western border of Russia with the neighboring countries, which would be the Baltic states, which would be Poland, which would be Ukraine right here that we're going to talk about in detail a little bit later. So that would be probably the current definition of the boundary between Asia and Europe. Now, a lot of times, this little peninsula right here is called, that's Turkey, the country of Turkey. They just had a huge earthquake there, if you've been watching the news at all. Turkey is technically on the Asian continent. It's an Asian country. However, you're going to hear Turkey talked about quite a bit with Europe because it actually kind of touches Europe right next to Greece and Romania down here in the corner. And it shares in some of the alliances like NATO. It's in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it has close ties with some European nations even though it's a Europe or an Asian country and it is a Muslim country. So it probably fits closer to the Middle East with regards to culture, religion, language. However, it's close enough to Europe that sometimes people talk about it with Europe, but physically it's part of Asia. So I just wanted to point that out. Another thing I want to point out too that we're going to talk about later, I'm not going to say much about it right now, is this is Africa, the continent of Africa. And we'll be going over Africa in subsequent chapters as well. <clears throat> but I just wanted to point out where it is. Because when we talk about immigration, this is going to be important. Look at the United States over here. This is North America. And see where most of our immigrants come from. There's Mexico, Central America, South America. So we have a lot of immigration here. They come from the Latin countries, Middle and South America. Well, a lot of the immigrants in Europe come from either Africa or parts of Asia, the Middle East, go to Europe. So they have similar immigration issues that we have in the United States, but it's a different population, a different subset, different cultures that are going there than we get here in the United States, although they are similar in scope and how they affect the countries there. So I just wanted to point that out. One other thing physically that I want to point out. If you look here where the United States is located, and Kentucky would be around this area about where the T is in states. So you know our climate here, but if you look at Europe, if you draw a line instead of cross, you can see almost all of Europe is north of where Kentucky is. Maybe a little bit of Spain might be about the same as Kentucky, but I'm just kind of looking at the map. I could find that information if I wanted to. But most of Europe would be closer to where Canada is than the United States as far as latitude goes, how far north it is. However, they have a very similar climate as we have here 
in our part of the United States. So you might wonder why that is. Well, we're going to discuss that here in just a few minutes. It has a lot to do with some things that we've talked about before, like ocean currents that move ocean water around the world. And in this case, it's moving warm currents from the equator up the east coast of the United States and across over to Europe. And that's what moderates the temperatures there. And it's not as cold as it would be, say, in Canada. So I just wanted to point those out those locations. So again, I've already mentioned this. This is talking about the boundaries of Europe. Um, pretty clear boundaries on uh, most of the sides, but where it touches Asia, it's not, as I just just kind of told you about. And they call it a, a it's a realm or a continent of peninsulas, which it it's the westernmost peninsula of Eurasia. So the whole thing is really peninsula, but there's also individual smaller peninsulas on that, and we'll see that here in just a few minutes. So here's the climate scheme, and again, you can see most of this is very similar to what we have in the eastern United States. It's not till you get up far north and you, you get into the polar kind of areas up here, even though this land is sitting way north over we are in the United States right now. So it's pretty... Um, I guess nutrient-rich area or resource-rich area. It has forest. It has a lot of fresh water, a lot of good soils. It's good for farming. It has a lot of minerals. So there's a lot of raw materials there. It's also very highly populated. Now, when you look at the physiography of it, the physical geography, you're looking at basically lowlands in the green areas some uplands in these areas and your mountainous areas is in the darker kind of orange color here <clears throat> and then up north you have some more mountainous type of areas up here as well the color scheme's not very good on this map i'm not crazy about that that's one thing with that we learned to do a long time ago when we made maps is make sure we differentiate color so you can kind of tell what's going on so here are some of the characteristics of some of these different physical geography areas. Again, this is in your textbook. I'm not going to really get into detail on these slides right now just because of time. But you can see here, this is kind of what I was talking about before. Um, right here is the North Pole. So it kind of shows you as you go away from the North Pole that Europe is a lot closer or further north than most of North America is. So again, you have those arson currents that are actually moderating the climate up there, even though it's further north, it has a more similar cl climate to what we have here. And because of its location, <clears throat> because it is kind of a peninsula, a lot of the countries are very close to either navigable rivers or the ocean. So you have a lot of potential for travel, um, outreach, um, interaction with other countries. So it make, makes it a really prime location as far as the countries that are there in reacting with the rest of the world. You saw the emergence of city-states <clears throat> in Europe. And that's another point that I want to get to, is that, you know, I, I've talked about the, the colonization and the colonialism that we saw as the European countries began spreading out to the Americas that we've already talked about, to Africa, to Asia, and colonizing and we saw that because Europe, for just probably by chance as much as anything else, developed earlier in, those, in their social abilities as far as creating governments. You saw early examples of democracy in ancient Greece. You saw these city-states starting to form. And that's really where we got the model of our, our current nations that we have. When you have a city-state, the area around it is homogenous. That means it has a similar culture, similar language. <clears throat> that area might grow, it might shrink. But then you have kind of country boundaries starting to form. And that's where we get that model of modern countries is from Europe and European history. So that's another impact <clears throat> that Europe has had on the rest of the world is really how we model our countries and even a lot of our governments comes from European history.
also you had the industrial revolution that started in europe again i'm not going to go into detail on this you'll read about this in your textbook but basically what that started was a few things it started specialization and doing things so people started getting jobs so you could go find a job to do something specific and people could have specialties what it also started doing was moving people from the countries to the cities where you could get these jobs so you're moving from rural populations to more urban populations because more people went to the cities because they had that industrial revolution they had factories they had jobs in these different types of things that were being developed so that kind of spurred a new economic model that has led to the modern day countries that we see today another thing that they did and this relates back to the colonialism that we we discussed in the americas and, and everywhere else they went like africa or asia is they started going to these countries to get raw materials to bring back to these new industries these new technologies that they're developing because these things take raw materials to make things <clears throat> so in large part they were going out and basically finding resources and taking them from other areas and bringing them back to europe so <clears throat> if you've ever seen avatar a lot of y'all probably are avatar fans um i am honestly to be honest um, that's kind of what that premise is about. Except it, instead of being a European country, it's the Earth and humans going to other planets to take resources. It's Throughout history, you'll see that same example of one group of people going other places to get resources when they run out of their own. So, <clears throat> this is just a brief history. Kind of, I've already mentioned this. Um, these are some of the specifics of that. But this is where you start moving into these countries, these nations that we've mentioned, and you're starting to get political ideas that develop. And you're going to start to see different things. You see here some catchphrases. Liberalism and socialism. Those are kind of the same side of the aisle. So, right, so you all know about politics in the United States. You've got the left which are the liberals, and you've got their right, which are conservatives. So when you talk about liberalism, that's obviously the Democrats slash liberals here in the United States. Socialism is kind of an extreme example of that. Um, if you watch something like Fox News, you would think that we're a socialist country, and we are not. We're a democracy. However, we have some socialist programs. Communism would be the next step more extreme from socialism. That's what the Soviet Union was. That's what China is today. That's what Cuba traditionally was, was communist. That's the most left model of government that you can get. On the other side, you have the conservative, or in the United States, that would be the Republican side. And there you have the kind of the normal part of that's going to be your capitalism. And then you move to some nationalism. That's not an economic model, but that's more of a an identity type thing. And then you got fascism would be the extreme right. The Nazis were fascist in Nazi Germany. That was the extreme right-leaning group. So, as you can tell by the examples I just gave you, probably the best place to be in most governments is somewhere in the middle. The extremes of both parties are not very good places to be. And depending on <clears throat> what your disposition is, and in today's world, it makes it more difficult. And that's why I talk about these things in this class, not to form any opinions, but to let you know that we have so much social media now. And we have all these, new, what they call themselves, news organizations. Um, many of them are really kind of propaganda machines. And they'll make you believe one way or the other. If you watch one side, they're going to make you believe we're a communist country. If you watch the other side, they're going to make you believe we're a fascist country. So I'm giving you these definitions so you can kind of start making your own decisions about life and everything that is politics. But I want you to know, for this instance, <clears throat> this was kind of developed 
in the European model. And what you th see throughout history is you kind of swing, is see it swing back and forth. When you get really bad far-right fascism, you have Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. So, of course, after Hitler was defeated, you saw a swing back to the more socialism-type ideas because people want to get away from that fascism. So you, it's kind of like a pendulum. It swings back and forth depending on how bad a certain instance might be. People want to go from one to the other. And that's where we get the roots of our political system now here in the United States. So again, back to Europe, it's only 5% of the Earth's land area. It's a tiny area, 40 countries, so most of the countries are really small, especially compared to countries like the United States. And really these countries that we see today, they're not exactly how they've always been, but you can see it kind of, if you go back in history, they change a lot over time, but they're still roughly based on back in the feudal days, certain monarchs. Some countries still have monarchies, even though typically it's very rare for monarchs like kings and queens to actually run countries anymore. They're more for show or for tradition. They actually have legislators and things like that that actually do the governing of countries over there now. Um, but like the Queen of England, you know, she passed away here recently. She'd been there forever. She was the called a head of state, but really she had no function in government in England. It was the parliament, all those people that did that. So here's the nation state and nation definitions. <clears throat> Nationality relates to citizenship in the state and a cultural identity. And here you have your language um, differentiations in Europe, and it's crazy how many they, there are there. Um, but you have some kind of big groups. And one thing that a lot of people might be surprised at, people that haven't studied these types of things, of course you have your Latins, which is going to be your French, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish down here. And then you see the green. That's the Germanic languages. And you see English is a Germanic language. A lot of people probably don't realize that. But English is a Germanic language. Probably has a little Celtic mixed in there. <clears throat> but you can see the Germanic languages go all the way up into the Nordic countries up here as well. So a lot of people don't realize those things. When you talk about religions, um, historically Europe has been pri primarily Christian. Now, if you don't know your religions that well, um, Christianity actually has several different, we call, we call different Protestant factions, denominations here, like Baptist, Methodist, all those. Um, but Christians have a lot of different types. You have Protestants, which is largely what the United States is. That's the most predominant. Then you have Catholics, also Christians, of course but a little bit different than Protestants. Actually, Protestants broke away from the Catholics um, several centuries ago in England and Europe, and there was a big deal about all of that. You have the Orthodox Christians, which are probably the oldest part of Christianity, and then you have the Muslims, the, the Islam religion. And, of course, that is a different religion altogether than Christianity. So those are the predominant ones that you still find in Europe. And over time, since the 1960s, you see less Christian influence there, and you see the rise of Islam because of the immigration. And one thing that it doesn't mention here is there's a lot of people in Europe that also, as in the United States, are moving away from religion altogether. Um, the amount of atheists, agnostics, etc., it's been steadily rising in both the United States and in Europe over the last few decades. So, <clears throat> we have some definitions here. Um, functional region, complementarity, and transferability. Um, you can look at those in your textbook. The central business district of, is a simple concept of the basically the center of a city where most business is done. Um, that's going to be your for rural areas, it's going to be your town squares, Plaza de Armas in Latin America, 
or the city centers in larger cities like Nashville would be down around 2nd Avenue downtown area. Um, you can read about these in your textbook. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. <clears throat> So at the end of World War II, and I have two videos that I've assigned in your lesson about World War I and World War II both. Um, Europe was just totally ripped apart. The United States came in, not only helped Europe fight the war against Nazi Germany, and at times Italy, they were on Germany's side part of the time. Not only would it, did we come in and offer military assistance, but after the war, we had the Marshall Plan that basically paid for a lot of the rebuilding of, of Europe, including Germany. And that helped us to <clears throat> kind of unify the continent and have good relations with a lot of the countries there. So, in more recent decades, the European unification process kind of started... <clears throat> And they wanted to go through to a more secure environment for all the countries there. So they formed groups. One of the primary ones was the European Union. That's going to be more, and I'm going to let you read about that primary in your textbook. <clears throat> and there's a whole whole timeline in your textbook. I think it's on page 156 um, about the process of getting the countries together, having similar laws. Um, having more open borders between the individual countries. And, you know, we talk about borders here a lot, but when you're talking about Europe, you're talking about countries sometimes the size of counties here in the United States. So the travel between the countries there is oftentimes much easier than it would be with other countries in other parts of the world. And they try to come together with their laws, like I said, <clears throat> their politics, um, even their currency, they wanted to move to the euro, which they have done in large part. <clears throat> and that's all a good idea, and it's good for security. It's good to be unified in that way, um, especially when you have a lot of small countries. It's good to have that security. But as you can imagine, it's hard to get 10 people in one room to get along on everything, with everything. So when you have all these different countries as well, you start to have problems and disagreements. And there are good times and there are kind of difficult times when you go through processes like that. So I'm going to let you read about the differences in the Eurozone and the Shenzhen area in your textbook because it's going to take me more time than I have to explain these things. Just be sure to read over those things in your textbook because you will have some questions on those in your assignments. <clears throat> so when you have a, a common union like the European Union and you have unification, you're going to have things like a central bank. You're going to have things like a sin single currency like the euro. <clears throat> and you're going to have free and open trade. And that's a positive thing as long as all the countries benefit equally and people can get along with that. And you have certain areas and you can see here that that equity is not that great in Europe. You can see Eastern Europe and this, what these colors represent uh, is the gross domestic product. And that's basically how wealth of these areas are, how, how well off they are. Eastern Europe is very poor. And then you have this center area right here that does pretty well, mostly in Germany. And then you have, it's kind of sporadic in other places, but Eastern Europe is, is very poor. So <clears throat> when you have this inequality, and it's just like politics here, you know, we talk about welfare and social programs. Well, I don't want my taxes going to this or that or whatever. So think about doing that with 40 different countries. Of course, that's going to be taxing on some people. And the more people and the more countries you try to bring in, the more difficult it's going to be for everybody to get along. This map, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but this just shows you the orange areas that you see here are areas that, at some in some capacity want more freedom from their home countries and you can see some of these crossover borders like this one's part in France and part in Spain that's the Basque region so these people kind of have their own little culture up in this area think about Appalachia people of Eastern Kentucky um, maybe they feel like they're different than people over here in Western Kentucky and they wanted their own state. They wanted East Kentucky and West Kentucky to be their own states. 
that's what these orange areas are kind of representing on this map. Parts of these countries <clears throat> that have their own identity that kind of think, you know what? We'd be better off if we were on our own country. Um, Y'all might have heard sometimes in the news the last six, seven years, you hear every now and then Texas wants to secede from the United States. Yeah, that's great, and that might be mutually beneficial in some cases, but sometimes you might want to be careful what you wish for. <clears throat> because there is a certain security in a bigger country, in larger groups of countries like the European Union, if problems arise. And right now, in Europe, Russia has arisen, and they're looking at a lot more unity now than they probably have been in the last 15 to 20 years. So again, we're still talking about this, this influence, the, the, the problems with the larger and larger European Union. And you see here a map of, oh, this is actually transitioning to NATO. And NATO is not like the European Union. The European Union is a true union in the fact that it's political, it's economic, it's all those things. Whereas NATO is more just political slash defensive. It's a military pact that countries will defend each other if they were attacked. Is basically what NATO is. It's a military alliance, a little bit of politics, but mostly a military alliance. And this is very important because this is one of Putin's excuses of why he invaded Ukraine. He says he does not want them to join NATO. Actually, NATO um, had its issues in years past. The Trump administration was not a big fan of NATO. So it looked to be weakening a little bit. And Putin wanted to weaken it more, but what he has done is he's actually strengthened it quite a bit because now... We need NATO more than ever after his attack on Ukraine. And the European countries are realizing that now. So not only has he solidified NATO, but now some countries that weren't in NATO previously want in. Like Sweden and Finland up here. They've always been allies of the United States. We've never had any problems with these countries they just didn't want to join NATO because mostly they didn't want to make Russia mad and possibly make them attack them. <clears throat> but now that Russia has attacked Ukraine, suddenly Finland's like, well, if they can do that, then they can attack us, so we're going to go ahead and join NATO anyway. So we're looking at actually bringing in three or four more countries, with these two being the first two, into NATO and making it bigger than it was previous to the Russian attack. So I'll let you read and watch. I have plenty of videos on NATO. There's plenty to read about it. I'll let you check those out and not go over into detail in this, this particular lecture. So the European Union, getting back to the financial part, <clears throat> it had its problems starting in 2010. Um, the recession that we had back starting around 2007 and 8 in that area. By 2010, some of the countries in the European Union started defaulting. Greece, Ireland, Portugal, all had big problems. Italy, France, and the Netherlands, Spain, they all had really, really big issues. And the European Union was really, really stressed at that time. And they actually had to bail some of these countries out during that. Now, it's really stabilized since then, but at that time, it really tested it. And that, that kind of sowed the seeds for a 2016 vote in the United Kingdom, in England. And they voted, it's called Brexit. That means Britain exiting the European Union. They voted to leave the European Union. So that's a long process. It's not just like you can vote on it and just say, okay, we're out and walk away the next day. This thing is really integrated with regards to economies, their currencies, travel, all these different things. <clears throat> so they had to come up with a plan to leave, and they're still really working on that plan to leave. And they found it's been very difficult to actually get out of the European Union. And most people have kind of realized that it's probably not very smart to do that, especially in light of what just happened in, with Russia and Ukraine. So a lot of people in the country are calling for another vote on it 
to be able to vote again and kind of cancel Brexit and go back into the European Union wholeheartedly. So again, there are some countries <clears throat> in Europe that never joined the European Union. And you're going to see most of these are going to be over here in Eastern Europe, especially right around Russia. <clears throat> now, as you might imagine, from what I just told you about NATO, there's a big reason why, and that's because they're afraid of Russia. Russia has threatened them and threatened them not to join because they feel like it's imposing upon their freedoms, and they're threatened by that. So they basically kind of bully countries into not joining. In addition, a lot of these Eastern European countries were formerly part of the Soviet Union, which was Russia and a bunch of neighboring states that were, after World War II, incorporated in what they called the Soviet Union. And you're going to read about that in a little bit in this chapter and more in the next chapter. And those countries <clears throat> have broken up. And some of them just never joined. And then you have a place like Yugoslavia, which is a complete mess. It previously was a communist country. It was under the Iron Curtain or the Warsaw Pact, which was countries that weren't part of the Soviet Union, but basically the Soviet Union kind of controlled them. And there were a lot, it's a small country, but it has a lot of different cultures within the same country. And when that country split up, even though it was good for freedom and doing their own thing, because all these different cultures were so entwined in this very small area, terrible wars broke out, genocide, there was a lot of fighting. It was a really bad situation. So here we're back to NATO again. Um, I'm not going to talk about this a lot again. Turkey is part of NATO. <clears throat> Again, Turkey's down here. It's actually on the continent of Europe, but it, you can see here it basically touches right here at Bulgaria and Greece is right here. So <clears throat> Turkey is an Asian country that's actually part of NATO. And here's some of the specifics on NATO. Again, I'm going to let you read or watch the videos on that and read your textbook because I am already going way past time that I wanted to go on on this. <clears throat> the Baltic states... They're going to be up in this area. Again, here's Russia. These used to be part of the Soviet Union, so it used to be kind of part of Russia. But when Russia, the Soviet Union, broke apart in 1991, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they gained independence, and now they're part of NATO. <clears throat> so that's very important, and that's one of the things that Russia, these are the next states that could be on the chopping block if Russia decides to expand this war. Russia feels like these states, along with Ukraine, are theirs. They feel like they're historically their people. Therefore, they want to control these, these countries. You see Belarus here between Ukraine and the Baltic states. And all these are Baltic states, by the way. But you see Belarus here. Belarus is an independent country. However, it is a puppet state of Russia. The, the government still looks to Russia. Russia basically controls it. So for all intents and purposes, even though it is a country, it is an independent country, it's essentially controlled by Russia. So that's why I don't really mention Belarus a lot in any of these discussions. Um, you see the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. As you know, if you've been paying attention to the news at all, um, Europe was highly dependent on fossil fuels from Russia before this invasion. And they have quickly weaned themselves from that dependence. They still are dependent some, but they are quickly going away from that and not buying this from Russia any longer. And here's a more blown up map of this entire area. One interesting note right here, this little bitty spot right here, this is actually part of Russia. It's a part that they annexed back when they had all these countries in the Soviet Union and they kept it when these countries had gain their independence and you're going to see that mentioned in here in just a few minutes so i'm going to start kind of flying through some of these these are all in your textbook <clears throat> so 
the European population, I mentioned this about the United States, it's kind of flatlining with regards to native um, population growth. So they, de they depend on immigrants to grow their populations, which is important, as it is here. <clears throat> you know, sometimes immigration gets a bad rap, but if we want to continue to have our economic structures, we have to have people to support those systems. And if suddenly our population rate starts going down, our economy would collapse, basically, because we're not going to have enough people paying into the system that's going to be able to support the, the aging population of the native people. So that's a very important component, and it's really similar to the United States and, and the European countries. Um, again, we're talking about the Muslim immigration. I've already kind of <clears throat> mentioned this previously. Let me see. This is the core area, what they call the core area of, the, of Europe. And these are the different regions of Europe. <clears throat> um, you see your, your northern Europe. You see Mediterranean Europe, Western Europe, and Eastern Europe. And you see these kind of slash lines. Those are transition zones. And Belarus, like I said, it's essentially a puppet state of Russia. And then you see the part of Ukraine that Russia has essentially invaded and they kind of took it for a while, but they're kind of getting bounced back right now. So, so I'm going to fly through these because this is going region by region and the countries in them. Just remember that Western Europe is most closely related to the United States. Um, those are our closest allies. The closest to us with regards to their culture and their their economic and political sort of states. So that's Western Europe and the United States are very closely related. And Germany is part, Germany, France, Great Britain, all those countries are part of Western Europe. And you will read about all of this in your textbook. Well, I don't know really what happened there. Looks like I'm having a little bit of a technical issue with this PowerPoint presentation. So that's good for you guys. Okay. Hang on just a second and let me try to figure out what is wrong here. For some reason, I doubt I'm using this off of our OneDrive, so something's going on with the OneDrive, probably. So, I'll kind of cut it short here for just a few minutes. So, what I want you to remember is, is remember, you're going to see in your textbook a lot of maps. And it's a little bit confusing because I just showed you the, the areas of Europe, the regions of Europe. So you got Northern, Western, Eastern, and Mediterranean Europe. So basically, you've got four regions. But then you're going to see all these maps of different things like languages. And you're going to see the NATO maps. You're going to see all different kinds of maps, and I, I just want you to be able to keep these kind of separated as we go through, the, the, through these because they represent different things. And I am actually glancing through the textbook right now to see if there's anything. The core region of any of our realms is going to be 
where the most economic viable areas are. So it's going to be typically your larger cities and most of your population. And the map that I just showed you of that core region encompasses almost all of Western Europe. It goes into Eastern Europe just a little bit, over into Poland just a little bit. It captures Norway and Sweden down to the Mediterranean area. And if you notice, it kind of dog legs down to Spain and captures some of Italy as well down in the Mediterranean areas, Mediterranean region. So, and the reason it does that is basically it just goes down to capture Rome and Madrid, Spain, is what it does. So, remember that Eastern Europe is going to be the poorest. That was the area that was under the former Soviet Union, so it came out of a very difficult economic state back in 1991, and it really still has not gathered itself since then. It's better now. Um, some countries are making progress. Some countries are not making progress. Ukraine was actually one of the better of those countries. Um, when you look at Ukraine, it had industry. It, it's called the bed bread, bread basket of Asia, even though it's in Eastern Europe. Um, that was the bed, bread basket of the former Soviet Union. So most of the crops that the Russian people had when they were the Soviet Union came from Ukraine. So that's a hint, one of the reasons why they would like it back. There's a lot of natural resources there, a lot of agriculture, and Putin basically thinks that the Ukrainian people are the same as Russians, even though, in the same breath, he's committing essentially genocide against them. So, I want you to watch your videos on the Ukraine and Russian conflict, the invasion. Um, keep Crimea in mind. And... We're going to have a couple of Google My Earth exercises on that after you watch your videos that will kind of help you kind of figure out what's going on over there. And if you don't already, be sure you kind of keep up with current events and watch the news because it's really interesting what's going on and what's happening there. Um, I kind of, last semester I told my class, you know, when I was younger, <clears throat> I'm old enough, I'll date myself here, when I was like in grade school, um, we only had like three channels on our TV. Um, we had the network stations and that was it. So if this had happened when I was younger, this would have dominated the news every day, all day. That's all we have seen and talked about would have been the Ukraine and Russian conflict. In today's world of social media, you have so many distractions and so many different things you can look at that basically you can kind of just ignore it. But when you're in a class like this, it's good to watch current events and kind of keep up. It's going to show you that you're actually kind of getting something out of these classes because you're going to have a better understanding of why what's happening is happening and the consequences of that. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it off right here for this lecture. We'll continue the discussion in the next lecture about Russia and the Ukraine conflict. Um, as always, if you need anything on my end, feel free to let me know. If you're having any issues or need anything, need help, whatever the case, just let me know and I'll help out as well as I can.